Welcome back, boils and ghouls. It is trivia time. Tonight, I have for you truly one of the strangest behind the scenes stories about the origin of not one, but two of your favorite and most beloved Marvel characters. Did you know that for a nebulous moment in Marvel continuity, that they published two characters that were just about as different as could be from one another with the exact same origin? It's a curious case involving some of the biggest names in and from Marvel Comics at the time, so let's get into it. Tonight, we are talking about the strangely shared origin of none other than Wolverine and the Jessica Drew Spider-Woman. So I guess at least we're talking about one beloved Marvel character. It'll be a good one. Cool Wolverine facts, I promise that. How about that? By the 1970s, people were beginning to see the sheer amount of money to be made licensing comic book characters. And as a result, there was a war going on. There were new comics and new shows. There were licensing deals with just about any one you can think of for just about any thing you can think of. Now, Spider-Man was, and historically always has been, one of Marvel's biggest money makers. So, when word of a new character that Filmation Animation Studios was working on reached them in 1976, Marvel was not happy about it. At the time, Filmation had been running a well-received Tarzan cartoon, but they learned that when they teamed it with Batman and called it the Batman Tarzan Adventure Hour, it did even better. Imagine that. The only problem was that at least presumably, they had to pay to use the Batman likeness. So Filmation hatched a plan. Why pay to license characters when they could come up with a new series of their very own? Quickly moving into development, they designed five proposed superhero characters, one of which happened to be the completely tasteful, respectful, and totally non-copyright infringing Spider-Woman. Yeah, Marvel was pissed. Marvel was really pissed. But they knew that they had to act fast to secure the name before Filmation did. So then editor-in-chief Archie Goodwin got artist Sal Buscema and writer Jim Mooney to rush production on what would become the contents of Marvel Spotlight number 32, which would introduce Jessica Drew Spider-Woman, kind of. Marvel would beat Filmation to the punch with the name, but they had to cut a lot of corners to get there, and no one was particularly concerned about making fine art during the creation of Spider-Woman. She was only intended to be a one-shot character, tying up the name, thereby forcing Filmation to change the name of their character. The Spider-Woman creative team had absolutely nothing to go on and pressure from every angle. And there would be no cousin this time to get a blood infusion, gaining superpowers in the process to come to the rescue. This time, Marvel insisted that the book have zero connection to or association with Spider-Man or the Spider-Man books for fear of watering down the brand name after negative fan backlash having to do with the creation of She-Hulk. As time ran out, editorial did not cave on this fact like you would expect, despite the fact that no one in the writer's room came up with an idea that they greenlit either. Instead, Marvel would choose an utterly bizarre and almost unexplainably strange route, hijacking a proposed origin story that was unfolding in a completely unrelated title at that time to a completely unrelated character, who in fact was a completely unrelated sex. When Wolverine originally showed up in the pages of the Incredible Hulk 180-181, I had always heard that he was designed as a one and done character. Someone who was tough enough to fight the Hulk, but someone who was not developed enough for the larger Marvel Universe at the time. Creator and writer Lynn Wein has revealed in interviews, however, that he had always had plans to bring Wolverine into the fold of the new X-Men cast when and if it ever got off of the ground, that is. When I first created Wolverine, I created him as a Canadian mutant, specifically so that whomever ended up with the assignment of writing the new X-Men book should it ever occur would have a Canadian mutant handy if he wanted him. If you want to learn more about that, make sure you check out my Jim Steranko X-Men episode. 
Things seem to have been in flux around Wolverine since basically day one. Artist Gil Kane, who did the pencils for the cover for Wolverine's introduction into the Marvel Mutant Universe in giant sized X-Men number one, completely changed his mask design from the original cat-like design to, in my opinion, a much cooler Batman inspired mask, but with zero permission or warning. This in turn forced the series artist Dave Cockrum to use this altered mask design on the interiors of giant sized X-Men and thus subsequent appearances as well. But things didn't stop there. Originally Wolverine was supposed to be a teenager like all the other X-Men. But again, artist problems. When Dave Cockrum drew him without his mask for the first time in issue 98, he was obviously much older, again forcing new work to be done on the character. If his fluctuating appearance wasn't difficult enough to deal with, no one really knew what Wolverine's origins were or what they were going to be either. There were some weird enigmatic clues in the beginning, but they never really led anywhere and they definitely never added up. Then again in issue 98, Wolverine sets off a detector when he's scanned after being captured by sentinels, indicating that he's not actually a mutant. And this is for a good reason. He wasn't, at least not really. See, the original idea for Wolverine's origin is that he's actually a highly evolved Wolverine. Yeah, Wolverine was going to be an actual wild Wolverine cub, an animal that was supposedly mutated and evolved into what would later become known as New Men by this fairly obscure Marvel supervillain, the high evolutionary that you may or may not have heard of, who's obviously obsessed with evolution. Now, this has been well known in nerd circles for years, but when this fact was first presented to a wider audience as part of some of the X-Film special features attributing the idea to Lynn Wein, he completely flipped out. Lynn Wein emphatically stated that he never planned for Wolverine to be anything other than a mutant, adding that he had no idea where this weird origin idea had come from, guessing that it was maybe writer Chris Claremont who took over, or Dave Cockrum, the artist on the series at the time. Now, in a reprinted collection of Incredible Hulk number 180 and 181, called ironically The Incredible Hulk and Wolverine, there's a six page article by a Marvel historian about the origins and the evolution of Wolverine up to that point in 1986. And in that article, there is a quote from Dave Cockrum explicitly stating that he had planned to have the high evolutionary play a vital role in Wolverine's origin. Chris Claremont has likewise also stated that it was always a shared idea between between Cockrum and himself, and that they were the ones who cooked up the presentation for editorial in 1976. But there was a big problem. According to Dave Cockrum, the idea got nixed, and it got nixed from on high. Stan Lee himself, for one reason or another, personally decreed that Wolverine was not to be a mutated Wolverine. Lee seemed to take a personal stake at different points in the X-Men title over the years, so people wrote this off thinking that he thought the idea might have been too weird or outlandish or might just have not fit with the title. Lee himself never commented on the subject, and he had, let's say, a selective or subjective memory at best, so he often proves to be an unreliable narrator anyway. I don't know what Lee's real angle was, but I do know that he personally acts the origin idea for Wolverine himself. I also know it was right around this period, 1976, that Marvel was scrambling over themselves to assemble the content for what would become Marvel Spotlight number 32. They had nothing, no character, no story, no design, no ideas. All they had was a name and a mandate that Spider-Woman be in no way related to or connected with Spider-Man or the Spider-Man books. At this point, the mutated Wolverine idea might have been too stupid and far out for the X-Men title. But to secure what was basically an open loophole with Spider-Woman as an unlicensed character and the filmation show quickly approaching completion, it obviously was not too stupid of an idea for the Jessica Drew Spider-Woman. In her very first appearance in Marvel Spotlight number 32, Spider-Woman was indeed an actual spider that had been mutated into human physical form by the High Evolutionary. 
She was then also brainwashed and tricked into working for Hydra and also tricked into believing that she had always been a person. It's weird and kind of tragic and that's something that the original story seemed to kind of wallow in actually. The comic is even weirder than the premise, with Spider-Woman spending a long time completely distraught about her condition, not knowing what to think of herself as this mutated creature tricked into believing she was a human being to serve the sick and twisted agenda of the same mad scientist responsible for her transformation in the first place. It was weird, and I can only imagine what Chris Claremont would have done with this idea had they actually followed through with on their plans using this origin for Wolverine. Obviously, we will never know. Also, we will never know why Stan Lee would be so invested in a fairly obscure single character from a team book when he had so much going on around him either. I never actually believed the story about Stan Lee's intervention until I read the direct quote from Dave Cockrum. But maybe word did come down from Stan Lee himself not to use the Wolverine origin. And maybe this wasn't because he thought it was too weird or outlandish or even dumb to use in the X-Men title. Maybe it wasn't him taking any kind of personal interest in the character at all. Maybe it was because they needed a story for Spider-Woman and they had absolutely nowhere else to turn. And they knew that the lost profits from not securing the rights to the name Spider-Woman greatly outweighed the needs of one character in a book with an ensemble cast of leads and a more than competent creative team. Things all of which which were woefully lacking from Spider-Woman. I guess in the end it doesn't really matter what his motivations were either, because as weird and funny as it may seem, for a weird and brief time, Wolverine and Spider-Woman did indeed have the exact same origin. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If not, tune in tomorrow. Totally different fact about a totally different thing. If you did, please hit that like button. If you really enjoyed what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, ding the little notification bell to keep up with these doses of trivia that I'm dropping all the time. If you really enjoyed what you saw, think about getting in the comment section below and letting me know. If you'd like to see an episode about something, get in the comment section below and let me know as well. I'll do my best to make something happen for you. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.